AVSI is the largest unmanned vehicle systems association in the world. 8,000 members, 40 chapters. I run the Northern California chapter, which means from San Luis Obispo to Oregon out to the mountains, it's my territory. And you can imagine from agriculture to fighting mosquitoes to amazing technology like LIDAR, which we're learning about today, it's a very exciting job. Um, today, I'm going to talk a little bit about cyber. Ooh. So my background is I spent the last 30 years as a software engineer working for the DOD and intelligence communities uh, and contracting. So I've worked for groups like the NFL, was the first webmaster for the Redskins, and, and all the way down the line, I've had these opportunities to experiment. When I operated in a, a ISP in Iraq for our troops, we had satellite links and layers of layers of communication. And all throughout my career, I've noticed one thing, and that is networks are never individuals. They're always together with something else, and we always wonder, what is that something else? And so today, I brought together a group of folks that I think can talk about the implementation side, the technical side, and where we've been and where we're going to go. So with that, let me introduce my panel. So for folks that are not familiar with cybersecurity and this world, you know, chips don't just work by themselves. They have operating systems and networks, and they communicate. And what we're going to try and do today is really at a high level and still trust and talk about what is the next step to make this realization of an autonomous society, this force multiplier we really want. So I'm going to introduce my first panelist, Jeff Cooper. He's an Intel fellow. He's somebody who has been around a lot, and I want him to tell us a little bit about the history of what we're fighting for, which is data security and integrity. Frank Farshidi, Dr. Farshidi, runs all the roads that we drove here today. He is from the city of San Jose and is an implementer. So when we think about all these great technologies and wonder what they can do, we're going to talk to him about that. Cyber Reason and Sam Curry. Sam is a deep, deep cyber researcher. He's got an understanding of the IoT side all the way up to the edge. And edges are where the cyber risk is. And so we're going to ask Sam for that. And on our policy side, to round things up, we have Justin Taos from Aiken Gump. Justin brings a wealth of understanding about what the next generation of unmanned traffic and robotics is going to be. You can imagine that these, these cars are going to need to start to talk to each other. And just like the future of a drone delivery or something that might happen, it all starts with testing and discipline. So we're going to talk a little bit about that. So what is trust? How many folks saw what happened in England or have heard <coughs> recently about drone incursions? Raise your hand if you heard about this. Do you know that it shut down the airport and cost hundreds of millions of dollars? How many times can we afford for this to happen? What is ultimately these trust factors? Well, it goes down to risk. So I want to turn to my panel, and first thing I want to talk about is, you know, as we relate to risk, there are three components of risk in the cyber world, threat, consequence, and vulnerability. And so I'll turn to, to Jeff first, and I wonder, what is your opinion on how things have progressed with autonomous technology, mm -hmm. and do you think that we still have a threat? Well, there's always threats. There's always threats. We have, uh, in the old days, we had packets coming in, and we worried about packets that would cause trouble. Uh, we had to go in and apply policy to them based on the threat models. We had to go and apply severities to them. Uh, now we have devices that are actually in the physical world. They're moving around, and we still have to go and apply threat models to them. We have to go and apply policy, and we have to figure out what the, the consequence is going to be. And then there's this safety consequence that we all we have to bring in. So it's a, it's a much more complicated world that we're getting into. But so, that's progress, right? So that is, and I, and I want to uh, point out that building firewalls in the 90s and the lessons we learned are still applicable <clears throat> today. And let's talk a little bit about that. Sam, your background with cyber and, and what's coming down with uh, 13363 reaffirm the U.S. critical infrastructure. The roads and the air are part of that infrastructure. Would you agree? And, and what do you see as what are the biggest risks and how can we improve this? Sure. So uh, I think there's no doubt that roads and air are part of critical infrastructure. Uh, the question of critical to what is an important question to ask because uh, the sort of the, the, you can think of it as concentric rings uh, continu continuity of government and civilization, but also things like the economy, right? It, do, do as many people die when a bank or two goes down? No, but does it hurt us? Yes, it can really hurt us. And a lot of the 
you know, I, I would characterize it this way. The seams between the digital and the physical world are becoming very blurred. Yeah. Work, play, corporate life, uh, your personal life at home, your work life personally versus the corporation's risks that you may work for or a government entity. Um, that line is so blurred, you can no longer point to it and say, hey, now we're in a physical context or now we're in a digital context. Right. And so in some ways, the, the information superhighway is becoming much more blurred with all the other highways that we literally use. And being able to, to pull them apart is going to get much more difficult. So, so risk could be, yes, uh, you'll hear the FUD, right? The fear, uncertainty, and data, what could be done. And right. there'll probably be some cool stuff that comes out of the panel. But it can also be insider information is readable by just forget autonomous, just having intelligent vehicles. Mm -hmm. Where are people doing deals because they were on planes or they all drove to a same location, for instance? Uh, it's the same thing as cracking a social network or cracking cell phones. Now we have many more points of telemetry. Right. So I'd say it's a very rich world, and it's also one where risks will come from places we didn't think, and the degree to which data is being generated and needs to be, I, I, let's use autonomy in a different context. Autonomy has to be given back to those who probably really own data you know, and, and know which use cases like law enforcement or public safety needs to override that, but otherwise we're going to be in a world where data autonomy is going to be critical if we're going to look at vehicle autonomy or drones or airplanes and things like that as well. This is an important point. Do we trust these machines? Who built them? Oh, Are they certified? Trust itself is, is uh, in security we say trust but verify. Um, the establishment of trust requires knowing how they will behave on certain conditions and what the yeah. boundary and edge cases are. Um, and that's still early days for a lot of this. And it's, it, it feels like science fiction because it's coming at us so fast. Things that were science fiction are now reality. And the, that the time to reality is sort of shortening, if you will. This is an important point because consequences are, could be people die. At worst, people don't trust these things. Frank, what do you think about implementing a technology like an autonomous inspection vehicle in your plans? Do you see that as a vulnerability as much as you see it as a force multiplier <laughs> for your operations of the city streets here in San Jose? Yeah, sure. Uh, so. Uh, just a little bit of background about you know what we do at the you know at the city. So we we have a, a pretty uh, big infrastructure, uh, transportation infrastructure, and requires uh, regular maintenance. So we have 4,300 uh, lane miles of streets uh, within the city uh, boundaries, and you know our objective and goal is to maintain this infrastructure as efficient and effective uh, uh, possible. So we're always looking for innovative. Uh, technologies that could uh, help us do it better, uh, cheaper, and faster. But we, uh, with the same, to and the same token, we take uh, risk and uh, public safety very seriously. And any technology that is uh, going to help us in any of these areas, it has to be uh, proved first that you know, there's no uh, uh, threat and you know, all the security measures are met and mm -hmm. befo before we actually go into a full implementation. Uh, again, uh, you know, it's a it's a fine balance, but it has to have uh, it has to you know pass all the uh, you know policy uh, people and yeah. you know uh, the regulations that are in place for good reasons. You know, from uh, federal level to down to state level and uh, local uh, government agencies before we could. There have to be known entities for you, right? You got to say, I know what this will do when I plug it in. Exactly. And we have to know, you know, we have to have that assurance before we actually, you know, uh, go uh, with the full implementation. But on the other side, having a model behind something so that you actually have a, a, a computer representation of the data representing each of the devices that are moving around, each of the cars that are moving on your streets, that can be an advantage for you, right? You can, you can use that to do aggregate processing of that information and to get a picture that you couldn't get otherwise. So the ultimate QA, way, right? I mean, yeah. uh, hopefully we'll be able to model this with far more real-like real testing <coughs> before it hits the road than would ever have otherwise. Right. And if you have devices that are, that are not part of the system, if somebody has ripped their computer out or something like that or has an old card, doesn't have a computer, mm -hmm. you can spot those because the cameras will pick them up. But Give them a bigger buffer. But they won't have any, um, they won't have any, any telemetry coming in. So, so you have an opportunities as well as, as threats. I love it. You know, this is exactly what I was hoping for. I'm going to just touch a little bit about the ground. We, as technical folks, love to, to envision great and wonderful things. But, you know, at the end of the day, it's about people and policy. And, Justin, reducing um, 
technological advances like ADSB, which are mandated in 2020 for aircraft to track aircraft, are a function of remote ID. I guess, you know, at the end of the day, what challenges do you see coming for full autonomous vehicles, whether it's on the air or in the ground? Where do you think that might yeah, lie? Yeah, um, <clears throat> remote ID is a, is a great point because that gets to creating that trust. Um, I think folks, the, the public, the regulators, certainly the sec federal security agencies, uh, won't have the required level of trust that we need until you know that you can remotely identify, especially air vehicles, um, you know, for uh, as far as assuring accountability. Um, ADSB, Equip 2020, which, as you mentioned, uh, is a good step in that direction because uh, most aircraft flying in controlled airspace now will, will have will have basically some uh, uh, method of transponding and, mm -hmm. and identifying their location. However, it's not everyone. And certainly in uncontrolled airspace, uh, that's not going to be the case. So there's going to be uh, a lot of other types of technology that are going to be required to be able to broadcast uh, in order to plug into a UTM system, an unmanned traffic management system. And that's going to create a lot of uh, cyber questions. So ADSB has one level of, you know, kind of guaranteed security uh, as far as a, a potential link. Um, and then as you kind of go down, because we're going to run out of bandwidth there, if, if we're talking about millions of operations uh, we're, you know, with ADSB, you're going to have to start looking at other types of license spectrum for certain operations. And then there's you know, also the use of currently of unlicensed spectrum as well. And what are the security requirements that would require it for different types of operations, whether right. they have hazardous materials, size of the aircraft, potential damage they could cause, if it's in an urban area, highly populated, not. And we have to really dig into that to create some standards. So what's important about this is that on all fronts, whether it's technological, intel, <clears throat> on the front lines with cyber reason, dealing with our infrastructure and our policy, we're figuring these things out right now. And these are the times in 2020 we'll look back on and we'll recognize that these regulations were set, that drones and autonomy fully took hold in our society and, and did what we expected it to. And at the end of the day, you know, it's about people getting things done and making life better. And if you look at the graph in front of us, threat, consequences, and vulnerability, we've tried to expl explain it from different perspectives, but <clears throat> what ultimately is the risk to us as a society, having all these scanners, having all of our data brought together in a network effect? Can we count on these networks to actually do this? There's something called level five autonomy, and it's an SAE uh, nomenclature which defines what true sentient autonomy would be. It would be an autonomous vehicle that didn't need to phone home. It would completely run itself by itself. It would see you. It wouldn't need to send any of your critical data or anything outside over the wire. So my thought on all of this is that's a great vision. Self-driving cars could prevent deaths, increase the lower uh, income mobility for folks, and it might also give hackers a new playground. So my question to each one of you, do you feel that level five autonomy in our, in our future is actually secure. Jeff. Well, we have a ways to go to make sure that it's gonna be there. Um, I think that uh, we're, you, have to, you have to draw the hockey puck around the device and make sure that it doesn't go outside of the boundaries. You need a multi-dimensional space mm -hmm. to be able to understand the different vectors, the different way the device can go. Is it gonna, get, is it gonna go too fast? So its momentum will carry it outside of the safe area. Yeah. Is it going to be uh, interacting with too many devices? Is it going into a no no go session section? Um, so so there there are you know a bunch of different things that you you need to do to make sure that the technology is safe. There's going to be a big issue for certification. Uh, we're going to have to bring uh, things like uh, machine root of trust types attestation to be able to say. Uh, I have a device and I said it was safe and here I can prove that it's still in the state that was in when I said it was safe when somebody actually verified it. So we That's have right. a long way to go to really get there. Yeah. You know, good, good points here. Yeah. Please. So uh, <clears throat> being a level five autonomous vehicle intelligence wouldn't necessarily mean it passed the, the Turing test. It doesn't mean that it's a human intelligence, but it means in its own way it's able to survive on its own and thrive. So we have to think in terms of how we want to build the incentives for those machines. Mm -hmm. uh, in other words, it could survive while cut off, but it, it should gain benefits when connected. And you know, Asimov notwithstanding, there were no three laws of robotics, right? You can't really enforce that. How it evolves later uh, matters a big deal, especially when it's cut off. Yeah. Um, but I want to go to what Jeff was talking <coughs> about as well, which is in the world of, of intelligent things, or more progressively intelligent things, we haven't done enough before we even give it a level five autonomy. 
So what well, you mentioned, um, I call them hardware machine root of trust. It's vitally important to get trust that we have good crypto that comes from a place that is at least a more, a more or high level of security enclave, yeah. that we have the right roots of trust to tether from that and extend trust out. But also, we don't ship with default identities, that every machine actually has an identity that's verifiable and unique and enforceable. <coughs> that otherwise, we're putting machines out in the world that are effectively going to be digital pollution. That's right. Um, but we also make them patchable and recoverable and that these things can take care of themselves, and they have to trust us. If yeah. I, if I would, let's just take the extreme hypothesis of I'm an intelligent machine, and I like my life, and I get my incentives, and I happen to drive you around, and I'm cool with that. Now I need to know that when I get an update, you're not going to change me, <laughs> at least not in a way that I don't, that I don't recognize myself. Mm -hmm. And we're getting awfully close to the fear that people often have of the machine and the other achieving parity intelligence or close to it. Mm -hmm. That's not really relevant for a long time. No. Not yet. But we do need to think about how to make all the things intel in in secure well, I think rather than just intelligent. You know, a drifting of data. Where's your data going? You know, you ever wondered that? You ever wondered all the places your information has traveled throughout the world? This summer we had uh, uh, Operation Soft Cell, which was telcos getting hacked for call data records, CDRs. This was to track human being behavior by nation states. We were worried about Cambridge Analytica and about election manipulation. Mm -hmm. The data in cars will be incredibly rich yeah. and interacting with a lot of other computing things. If we don't think about who has access to those data planes, that's effectively privacy null time, right? So we have to think about as you generate information in your life and as the car does and as it interacts with other things, there's an uber graph of all things connected. Who has rights over it and then what uses do they get put to? And that debate is still very early. This is, this is perfect. Without terrifying Frank about security, you know, who has data rights and this idea of hackers threatening, you know, your data set, is that something you're concerned about? Would you bring autonomous systems in right now? We have a perfect street cleaner outside that could be useful to the city. What do you think about that? Yeah, it's a very good question. So, again, you know, as I mentioned, uh, uh, Security is a you know uh, is is a major uh, uh, thing that we have to consider implementing any new technologies, uh, whether it's for infrastructure maintenance or even you know uh, a pilot program with self-driving cars or anything that uh, uh, you know we are letting uh, in, on our streets right. So uh, there's uh, checks and balances, and you know there, it has to meet all those objectives before it can go to even a uh, pilot program. So, but, but, you know, just, just to touch on that, you know, with any change, right, so, you know, this is a change, you know, self-driving cars and uh, more advanced uh, technologies uh, with uh, maintenance vehicles or, what, you know, sweepers that you mentioned uh, that, you know, are available now. Uh, there's also, you know, uh, a pilot program, right? So you, you, could, you don't have to go with full Im implementation to begin with. You start, you know, any change you want to implement anywhere, you got to uh, pilot, pilot it and, you know, st uh, start with small scale, maybe in a, in a contained environment, you know, not, not in a city right. environment first, right? I mean, maybe a parking lot or some private uh, parking lot where you have pretty much minim minimized or uh, uh, brought down all those risks to zero and gather data, test it out, pilot, uh, do multiple pilots, and uh, uh, then, you know, do, you know, staging from that. So point. at the end of the day, trust is established by a root of trust who issued the certificate. Then that person being Frank, who actually gave the contractor the ability to go out and do it and get that data, he knows when it comes back that that data has not been uh, has been, been compromised. So custody of data matters. At the end of the day, you know, policy and all of our engineering and, and, and aside, what, what do you think policy think are, uh, about hacking? And do they really feel like we're under threat for automated vehicles? Is this something in D.C. we have to slow down and take a look at, or are yeah. we speeding up? Absolutely. So I, I would separate into two things. Um, again, pushing back to the aviation side, Aviation has one thing that uh, maybe the ground vehicles, uh, one consideration ground vehicles don't as much, and that's swap, you know, the size, weight, and power uh, limitations. So when you're talking about small unmanned aircraft systems, for example, doing uh, package delivery, and even eventually urban air mobility will be uh, transporting passengers, you know, two to 
six passengers via these vehicles. Uh, we really can't, at this point, put all of the detect and avoid, sense and avoid um, you know, technology on each and indiv individual aircraft. So we're relying currently on communication uplinks from the ground and ground stations giving real-time information for sensing, uh, sensing and avoiding other aircraft. That opens up a major uh, security vulnerability. Mm -hmm. In addition to that, between now when we get to, you mentioned level five autonomy, where we can create a little bit more of a closed loop, there's requirements currently in FAA regulations where you must have a pilot in command. And all the interim phases until we get to auto certified autonomous operations include a pilot in the vehicle or a pilot on the ground operating this vehicle remotely. Therefore, we now have command and control, a C2 link that is a key vulnerability that can actually overtake the aircraft. Now, on a ground vehicle, there's some ways to create some organic security to where you might be able to prevent that from happening. So that's a key consideration right. in aviation. On the, sec uh, the second kind of part on this is the data security that you mentioned and the policy around that. There is a big push in, in Washington, D.C. right now around data security, especially around autonomous vehicles. There was just a legislation that is making it through the Defense Authorization Act, and there's a separate bill that would basically flat out uh, ban Chinese drones uh, for use by the federal government and those receiving funding from the federal government because they're afraid of information going back to China. On the flip side, you have a lot of companies, public safety agencies that are using, utilizing these aircraft because there's about an 80% market share there and they're the most effective and uh, cost effective options that are saying, hey, if you take these away from us, we won't be able to do these operations. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> so we need, uh, from a policy standpoint, we need to find a way to address, <clears throat> excuse me, address the issue, which is that security component without necessarily trying to hamstring right. and, and you know, handcuff all of those that are trying to use that technology. It's a challenge. Yeah, you have to effectively create rails in the sky and say that, that there's a ground system that is actually going off and defining where the railroad is that this particular um, UAV is yeah. allowed to go. And then so we can monitor it and we can see when it's out of spec when we can take and action. Right. modes when yeah. the command and control goes away. Yeah. Yeah. Right, right, right. So when we look at society in the future, and I think we all agree that this is a wonderful view of society when we have force multipliers that can deliver us you know, medical aid or change somebody's life. These are all wonderful things, but sentiment, not in my backyard, is, is how we all, all think about our lives. And I think that when we look at the statistics that are on the screen here, sentiment's changing. People are believing that this is not the worst thing ever. I remember when the internet came out and, and they thought, oh, now I gotta, different things I gotta communicate and all this kind of stuff. I said, guys, it's gonna be crazy. Great. It's going to be a force multiplier. We get to live and work wherever we want. Well, 15 years later, 20 years later, I, I look at all the cyber attacks, the data thieving, the, the, the things I didn't want to be part of. And I think that all of us, when we look at the AV future, we want to establish trust. And genuinely, this is how it starts. Each one of the panelists today has been talking about a perspective from an implementer from their past experience. And I think when you look at all of the privacy data and all these concerns, I want you guys to take one thing away from this. We're figuring it out. We got the best minds, we're setting standards, we're following models at work because we need to build something that is comprehensive and that at the end of the day that people can really trust in. So as we look around the world, whether it's frequencies that communicate with these autonomous vehicles, we need to keep an open playing field, no license spectrum. Keep the frequencies open. Let these things communicate in a way that we can identify who they are because the bad actors are the ones that we want to get off the street. And that's true of whether it's an aut autonomous vehicle, uh, something on your sidewalk, or, or what have you. So the last question I have for each of you is, is there a benefit to having two separate systems, an entertainment and a driver control system for autonomy? So let me start on the other end. Let's start with you. What do you think, Justin? Um, I'm not sure I understand the question. Sorry. <laughs> so, you know, right now, a command and control system. Yep. You mean that almost like a... a separate bandwidth. Life, like a lifeline system like this does not get interrupted. Yeah. The other one is just fluffy on top. One gets yeah. better QoS. Oh, yes. I see what you're saying. Oh, yeah, absolutely. Well, certainly. And or I maybe mean, several. Absolutely. So, I mean, I think that's kind of the direction we're, we're, we're heading already. Um, I think you have the, the critical functionalities, your command and control, and then you have your other payload type functionalities that can absolutely have different standards for cybersecurity in those lanes. I think that's already something that the industry is moving towards now, and uh, should continue later. So you threw me off the entertainment side. <laughs> so. That's good. Thank you. Frank, what do you think? Uh, it's not my area of expertise, so I'm going to pass on this. 
Would you be concerned or would you think it was a benefit if I said, I have a dedicated encrypted link just to talk to that autonomous operating system, separate from the data that it collects, the pictures, the LIDAR, the wonderful data. Just, hey, how's that operating system doing? Would that make you feel better about running 5,000 of these around town? I mean, yeah, I mean, common sense, right? So uh, the, the safest we can get it, the better we, uh, we all as a society will feel, right? So I mean, that's, that's the whole... Uh, it's about trust. So uh, adaptation of it, you know, it's about trust and, you know, uh, building that public uh, uh, comfort level with it. And, yeah. You know, that's just... And your not, assurance. It's, and it's not... It, and a lot of it is going to just evolve, as you mentioned, with time. So, right, it's just not going to happen overnight. But with time, you know... 20, 10, 20 uh, years from now, we're probably, uh, we have uh, good answers, but. Well, in time, we'll all be dead, as we know. So, uh, what do so, you think? Uh, I mean, two, two things. First is, I'd like to separate the notion of faith from trust. So, when you, when you show polls, like the one you put up there, very often it's showing what the comfort level or faith of a generation is, and as, the genera as younger generations who are more tech comfortable yeah. grow up, it looks like trust is going up. And you'll see that sp drops, these horrendous drops happen when something bad happens in the news, and then they sort of return to a level. And they, they creep up over time. Trust is different. Trust is verifiable that, I'm, that, that I know something about you and you know something about me to a degree of confidence that's very high. Now, not absolute, but high. And I would like to see a, the, the things we define as critical to continuing function, to confidentiality, integrity, availability, privacy, to the, to, to taking care of the data and safety of the passenger uh, or the users and those around them, I'd like to see m us become anti-fragile. I, I would like to see not mm. just a root of trust, but a mosaic of trust. So you can knock pegs out and there's more. That simply destroying one certificate somewhere doesn't end it. Or saying a random number generator somewhere means there's no trust. So it should be survivable if large chunks of the infrastructure literally go away. <laughs> Not just that so somebody point. jams the, the command and control, but they blow up the building that does it. It should not mean disaster. So let's make sure that recovery approach is zero. In other words, the time to get back to normal approach is zero. And then we can say that we're getting resilient. I would like to see the systems be not just have a dedicated channel, but also resilient in the, when they're under attack That's from good. multiple points. Thank you for that. Jeff, closing thoughts. What do you think um, about it? I'd really like to say that the, my kid in the back seat who's playing with Nintendo doesn't have access to the driving system. <laughs> I, I think that would be or better. Take, or take CPU away yeah. from it. Right. 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 Yeah. <laughs> hey, thank you very much, guys. I hope you've enjoyed this chat. We look forward to making uh, all this autonomous future safe and secure. And thank you very much. I'm Greg Deeds. See you guys next time. Thank you. Thank you. That was great.